Good morning. I'm honored to be here today as a face and a voice for the lupus community. When I was a shy and awkward child, I never aspired to speak on Capitol Hill. But then again, I never dreamt I would be diagnosed with lupus, fight for my life, and become a tenacious advocate for the past 26 years. Like most lupus patients, this disease cut me down in the prime of my life and has drastically impacted my future. It has stolen precious time for me, as well as the opportunities to have a successful career, financial security, or that of being a mother, just to name a few. I can tell you from firsthand experience that lupus is extremely complex, difficult to diagnose, potentially fatal, presently incurable, totally capricious, painfully limiting, life-altering, dream-stealing, career-ending, and financially, emotionally, and physically devastating. Lupus can affect virtually any part of the body, like Peggy said, making it the prototypical autoimmune disease. Like many lupus patients, I suffer from several other autoimmune diseases. So here are my numbers. Eight diagnosed autoimmune conditions, 32 medications a day, monthly treatments over $5,000, annual treatments about $150,000 right now. I used to weigh well over 200 pounds due to drug side effects. My entire digestive tract is impaired, and it takes five different drugs just to allow me to eat each and every day. The veins in my arms are useless, so I have a port for monthly infusions. And I have long hair because I cannot hold my arms up over my head to style shorter hair. Right now, I'm in a critical potassium crisis, and I'm having weekly seven-hour infusions. But I am just one of 50 million autoimmune sufferers and one of 1.5 million lupus sufferers, and I'm alive today because of a strong support system, and I'm proactive in my health care. My support system is made up of friends, family, and most especially, wonderful medical providers. So on that note, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. He is a practicing rheumatologist, or a lupologist, as we dub them. This is a special group of physicians who constantly make compassionate and innovative decisions regarding lupus treatment. Dr. Robert Katz is a professor of medicine of Rush University Medical Center and adjunct associate professor at Northwestern University, Feinberg School of Medicine, and Dr. Katz is listed in Best Doctors in America. Let's have a good round of applause for Dr. Katz. Thank you. Have you ever met a, a lupologist? <laughs> you know, I got into lupus because I thought it was the most fascinating disease in medicine. I think it still is, you know. And so, because it's a multi-system disease. And to doctors, that means different parts of the body, like the lining of the lungs, whoever thinks about that, called the pleura, the kidney, you know, the, the skin with various kinds of rashes, the joints. And sometimes it can be heartbreaking. Sometimes it's sort of just interesting. I mean, patients have it, and it's a chronic, lifelong disease. Once you have diagnosed, you've got lupus forever. And so therefore, we have to do something about it. We have to change people's lives who live with lupus um, because of that. Sometimes I'm not sure if people have lupus, and that's why they need a proper diagnosis. They usually need to go to a rheumatologist. It's complicated. Even people in general medicine who might see this from time to time realize it's complicated. So the other day when I was in Chicago, I saw that uh, Lady Gaga had canceled her concert because of maybe lupus. I said, well, I wonder if she really has lupus. <laughs> I have no idea. So let me tell you a little bit about this disease because when you walk out of here and people say, well, you went to a session on lupus, what is that? <laughs> I will try to explain it to you. And so... Um, <clears throat> Lupus is a, an immune system disease, but the immune system is you know, misguided. It's misdirected. It's protecting you, but it's also attacking you. That's sort of strange that it would do that. Why would it do that? Maybe it's, it has a different target, like initially a virus or whatever that got into some of your cells, and now the immune system is misdirected, thinking that virus is still there, whether it's there or not, and attacking your own cells. And so it's an autoimmune, a self-autoimmune disease, and again, the immune system can harm the body's own tissues uh, and healthy cells in lupus. So it's like an um, uh, airplane with a guidance system 
you don't want this to happen, right? Just a little bit off. Where are we landing? And that's the way the immune system is in lupus. Now, it can be a mild disease or it can be serious. We make the diagnosis based on the typical symptoms of lupus and also some specialized laboratory tests and sometimes biopsies and, and other means. And we have official American College of Rheumatology criteria to rely on as well. <clears throat> now, as Peggy said, uh, that there are many people who have lupus. The exact number is a bit uncertain, but many people, but they're, they're mostly young women, childbearing age. And they would say to me sometimes, I don't want to see my, I don't want my children to see me suffer. So I don't talk about it too much. And uh, so women are much more commonly get lupus in their childbearing years. And I'll tell you a couple of personal stories in a minute. Um, but sometimes children, sometimes older people develop lupus. Let me tell you about one, it can, lupus can be mild, joint pain, a rash on the face, especially with sun exposure. But Maria, she had kind of bad lupus. So that she's a lovely person, very effervescent, fun to be with in the room, but challenging. And she had pretty active lupus. At one point, she was in a coma. She had a baby. What was going to happen there? Then her kidneys failed despite aggressive treatment. Um, she wasn't all that compliant because of her children uh, or, uh, that she, and uh, home situation. She wasn't always there on time. So her kidneys failed. She's in dialysis now, and her husband just left her. It, it really can be heartbreaking. It's really a brutal disease in many cases, and that's why we need better research to fix it. So lupus affects various parts of the body, like um, you get hair loss, sensitivity to the sun, or you get actually a rash or sick from the sun. Uh, painful, swollen joints, fevers, um, kidney problems, rashes, and, and a lot of fatigue. And the way it presents initially, most people have joint pain and rash, but later they develop nephritis, kidney disease, and other things. So this is a lupus rash. It's on the face, usually on the cheeks like that. But it can be a sun-sensitive rash, too. It can be rather chronic. can be super severe can be all over the place. And again, it can be quite deep and red and uncomfortable. And it can leave scars. And this is a skin biopsy. And you can see these are where we doctors look to find the antibodies in lupus. And we see, oh, that looks like lupus. But we see that row there where the arrows are of the antibodies in the skin that are misdirected. Hair loss, mouth sores. Joint pain, sometimes, only occasionally, resulting in deformities. But it's a systemic disease. It affects all different parts of the body. I had a patient, Paul, young guy, athletic, strong guy, developed central nervous system, lupus, and about aged 22, despite a very aggressive treatment, very supportive family, he died suddenly. Um, it can be very difficult. I have a patient who, um, 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 two patients really, who just said what they wanted to do when they got better, because they had to have joint replacement surgery because the steroids, which make you heavy and swollen, especially in your face, which they, people hate taking, can make you very emotional. I, th I find that people who take steroids, if they're sort of up to begin with, they get hyperactive. And if they're sort of down to begin with, they may get more depressed, um, especially in higher doses. Well, they took steroids and got damage to their joints, both um, <clears throat> Angelica and uh, Alisa. And uh, when they did, <clears throat> um, all they wanted to do in the end was recover and, go and be able to dance. And both of them can do that now. One dances salsa and the other um, goes dancing all the time. And that's a triumph for them, a triumph for them. Uh, both of those people, I should have brought them here, wrote books about the experience of living with lupus. Uh, one of them was in a coma for a while, had central nervous system lupus. <clears throat> the other, again, had very damaged joints, had to have joint replacement surgery in her 20s. But both of them have recovered, and, and they can dance. And lupus can go into remission. It can quiet down, but it can be extremely aggressive. And it can be active. When it's active, it robs you of your life. It robs you of your life. 
This is a kidney biopsy. You can see that's the structure of the kidney. This is a bad kidney biopsy. There's no structure. That person might go on to receiving dialysis and maybe a kidney transplant. Serious disease for a young woman of childbearing age. Sarah said all she wanted to do is have children. She said she gave up on that hope a while ago because she kept getting sick with one thing or another thing, different systems, including her kidneys, from lupus. But Mary, Mary was a success story. She was told you can never have children. She went to different rheumatologists, doctors, and to get a better idea of a sense of her lupus. And for me, I thought the things had quieted down. I told her she can go ahead. She has two twins, and every time I see her, she reminds me, thank you so much for allowing me to have children. It can be a heartbreaking, dangerous uh, disease. This is what the kidney biopsy looks, showing all the antibodies. We can see those in lupus. In other kidney disease, you don't see. It doesn't look like that. This is a brain scan, and on the uh, left there, you see those dark areas. That's a stroke in lupus. So the MRI scan may show a stroke. A young person with a stroke may well be lupus. Now, these are these antibodies. Without going into any details, when you check the blood test, you're looking for these autoimmune antibodies. They shouldn't be there. And young people, why are they there? Why are antibodies to self, to your own DNA? Why do you have those? And that's part of lupus. And you can see them under the microscope, these immunofluorescent special antibodies. And then we have criteria to make the diagnosis, which include a number of different features because it's a multi-system complicated disease. And getting the diagnosis can be hard. And sometimes getting patients to see the right specialist, rheumatologists often, is challenging in terms of access and, and understanding of what's, what's wrong with them. It affects the family tremendously. It affects the family tremendously. And, and you talk to family members, and they're usually around. I tell patients to bring your family to, the meet, to our meetings so they can hear, so you have an extra pair of ears and people don't go home and say, I know he told me to take this prescription I, and see him in a month, you know, not, no details. So having an extra person there helps. Most families try to be very supportive. And then treatment, we have treatment that's reasonably effective but not, nothing really that great or new. So I'll tell you one thing about treatment and that's a drug for rheumatoid arthritis called Enbro. So back in the late 1990s, I used to see rheumatoid arthritis in people in wheelchairs all the time, and their joints were all twisted, and they weren't doing well. <clears throat> and then we were doing a clinical drug study for a new medication. It actually had to be injected, which most of them were pills before that. And I said, what is, what is this thing? We started injecting this into rheumatoid arthritis patients with severe active disease, so stiff, getting all crippled. Did you see the movie Awakening? I don't know if you saw it. You should see it. All these people woke up. They were almost instantly better. And that medicine has been approved to Enbro, and medicines similar to that have changed the course of rheumatoid arthritis, which is a cousin. It's also an autoimmune disease to lupus. So why can't we find better treatment for lupus? Because we need more funding. We need more biomedical research. We can't cut down now. We found different markers that are, you know, associated with active severe lupus, we need to antagonize those markers. We need to fight them. So this is one of the very toxic treatments, steroids, but also cytoxan can be very toxic to people. They uh, can lose fertility. They can even get leukemia sometimes and cancers. We need better treatment than that. And in terms of lupus research, we have basic research that uh, you know, Dr. Diamond will talk about, and Dr. Crow too. We have clinical research, what I participated in, clinical trials on patients. Now, you gotta be careful in clinical trials. You wanna be sure the drug is not toxic, it's safe, and it's effective. Otherwise, this could happen. This was a member of a placebo group. And so, you know, not really. <laughs> um, so these are some future treatment options. Don't write any of these down. Who knows whether any of them will be successful, but they're out there ready to be tested. The Lupus Research Institute has stimulated enough basic research that we need to move forward. We just need the funding, you know, because the scope and the pace of, of, of recent discoveries is, is quite exciting, but we need to go further. And if you just take any of these things, there are all these molecular targets. We need to figure out which ones apply to lupus, target them, and get these patients better. Thanks.